So, welcome to Crit Fail, and we are back with Alan, who is Gorilla with a Brush on Twitter and YouTube. Is it the same? Uh, if you search for Gorilla with a Brush on YouTube, you should be able to find me, yeah. And he does some amazing painting, especially freehand work. And we did a general discussion a while ago, but uh, today we're going to look at color selection, because I very much consider myself a intermediate painter, and with that my biggest issue I have is color selection. Now, if someone gives me a, like I've done a little bit of commission work and I did several for a guy who was doing a neutral character. All his characters were neutral. So he gave me a palette of gray, which is the color for neutral. And he said, make sure there's gray in there somewhere. And that was easy. I found that really easy. I sat down, chose something on the magic user, the cloak. I did gray and then added red for the dress. But when I do my own stuff, I tend to stumble on color selection. Get an idea. Uh, we were just talking about a Reaper Bones Ranger, about making him like a coastal ranger rather than the traditional woodland. And I'll jump on board with these ideas of greeny blues everywhere. And halfway through it, it won't work. Uh, I've got a wonderful barbarian from Ouroboros, which I did a grey cloak for, and I don't like the grey cloak now. And I do that a lot. That seems to be where I stumble, is I'll grab a colour, go, this is the main colour I want on this miniature, and halfway through, it's usually becoming a militant uh, clown, and uh, I don't like that. And that's usually when I have to respray and start from scratch or strip the paint off if you can and start from scratch it's wasted time and it always leaves me feeling just worse off mentally because it hasn't been like a, a feeling like a change of direction which can happen where you hit the middle of something and you go no you know what i want to do something else but you're excited about that and you realize that you should have done that from the beginning this is always feeling more like a failure that it's not right rather than a change of direction and your stuff though seems very very cool and usually seem to stick to it like when you're doing your twitch streams and that it's usually what you start with is sort of where you end up you might make some changes along the way but you seem to have an idea right from the start it's not just sort of like randomly choosing a color let's just sort of see what happens and then it worked out you seem to have a, a sort of an idea of what you want to do with a mini when you get it uh and not just because like we went like with atlantis did they give you any ideas what they wanted or they just gave you the minis and said paint them up no he just gave me the minis and and i think you know i i started off he was using pictures of my stuff before they actually hired me to paint i was just painting their models because i loved him so much and so he already saw the style that i had he's seen models i i sent him the orc war chieftain just as like a thank you for you know he had sent me some free models because i he was i was letting him use pictures of my stuff and then he sent me some free models and i was just like hey you sent me like probably way more than I would have asked for. So like, here's him. I painted, I painted one up and I sent it back to him. And then once he saw it in person, he was like, wow, I want more of this stuff done. So every so often they'll ask for like, Hey, for this model, I always really pictured that she had red hair. Can you make sure that she has red hair? But that's about the extent of, of the direction I get on them. Uh, yeah. so I really appreciate that from them. <laughs> So what's your usual process? Because I, I love the... Uh, it was Malifaux, wasn't it? The Day of the mm -hmm. Dead dancing. Yeah. Um, I, I always loved that that miniature. And when you when you got that miniature, did you decide that from the beginning that that's what you wanted to do with her? That you just went, this Day of the Dead, definitely. Right from the word go, that's what I'm going to do. So yes, yes, but kind of for two reasons. Um, so I had bought a whole bunch of the, for, of the bikers that they have. Is it Coom? Is that the the biker gang that they have for the one faction, the Hak Islam faction. Um, and I actually collected a, all of the biker people that they had. And I was going to paint all the bikes up with sugar skulls and flowers and do kind of a whole day of the dead themed biker gang. And all of theirs, if they had exposed faces was going to then be, you know, the masks or the, you know, the face paint and everything. So I really, really wanted to do some infinity models that had that style. And, uh, what one of the things I, I assembled them all, I primed them all, but then I just kind of got onto other projects. And I think probably what I did was I, I got 
my eyes got bigger than my stomach. Is that this thing? Right? That <laughs> I bought like all the bikers and I assembled all of them and primed all of them. And I'm looking at this giant pile of miniatures and going, this is going to take me forever to finish. What I should have done was buy one, paint it. And if I still enjoyed it, buy another one and then paint it to add. But I kind of, I think I went a little overboard and it forced me to a little lose, lose my enthusiasm for the project a little bit. So when I saw that miniature, just the dress that she's wearing and the pose that she's in, it's a very, uh, like a dancer pose, but it also, it really felt like it just fit that aesthetic very, very much. Like she looked like somebody from that culture. And so it just kind of said, you know, this is a natural opportunity for doing that kind of color scheme and that idea on another model and, and still have it come to life. So yeah, as soon as I saw her, I said, this, this really feels like this is the right model to do this on. Now, do you use a color wheel before, uh, like working on a mini to sort of look at the, the colors that go well together before doing something? Or you just sort of look at it and go, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go with this. So let me, let me give you the secret to my success here. All right. Here's the secret. <laughs> um, so first of all, before I say any of this stuff, I'm not a classically trained artist. I didn't got, go to art school. I don't, I haven't taken art classes. Um, a lot of the things that I've figured out work are just from trial and error and having things not work for me or just naturally sort of figuring out something that works. Um, so if you go and look at almost all of my models, you'll notice that there's actually only one like chromatic color on the model. Um, and then when I mean chromatic color is if you look, the chromatic color wheel is the color wheel everybody thinks about when they look. So it's it's got the red, the yellow, the blue, and then all the colors that fade in between all of those. The most important thing when you're painting miniatures is the things that don't appear on the color wheel, which is all your neutral colors or your even shades or tones of the colors that are on the color wheel. So you start getting, if you mix things across from each other on the color wheel, they're complementary colors. That's where you get the browns. And if you, if you then mix whites, you get the tans and things like that. So those are yeah. considered neutral colors when you start mixing across the color wheel and you get these uh, more desaturated colors. Uh, if you're mixing your own flesh paints, by the way, they basically are mixtures of the three primary colors and then they add white or they add black or they add a little bit of one of the three colors to kind of imbalance it towards a cool or a warm color tone. But all of the skin tones, um, so your skin tones, your browns, your tans, uh, blacks, whites, grays, those are all considered neutrals. I would even throw in terms of mini painting, um, if anybody does gold, so they paint metal parts gold, or they even do a non-metallic metal, which is technically going to be a yellow color, but the eye, if it's reading it as a metal, I, I believe that still feels like a neutral color. So if you'll go and look at my miniatures, basically there's usually one dominant color, like a blue, a red, a green, something like that. And then everything else on the model are what I would consider neutrals. Um, so if you were to bring one up, let me just think of one. To, like I said, they should all pretty much be good examples. But like if you look at Thrommel, so the dwarf I did for the judgment models, I just finished him like a month or two ago. He's got like a red undercoat that has a lot of freehand texture on it. Everything else on the model is brown, skin tone, or non-metallic metals. And those are all neutrals. Uh, you look at the girl and wolf model that I painted. Um, I finished her beginning of last year or maybe it was into the previous year the girl has a red coat and then the wolf is kind of neutral colors it's grays it's kind of tans uh, he's got a red mouth that kind of plays off of the red color in her but there's really no other non-neutral colors that stand out on that model um, the blue cave troll I painted for Atlantis he's got blue skin and I've I lightened it by adding lighter colors I darkened it by adding darker colors but it's all that same base blue Everything else is neutrals except he's got some red in his mouth, but like that kind of stuff just reads as yeah. normal. The alley that I did, the 75 millimeter kind of Tomb Raider girl, she has just pretty much green is the only dominant color. There's one extra color, which is blue, but they're like blue jean shorts. And again, yeah. the eye kind of sees that and sees it as normal just because everything you see, people are always wearing blue jeans and that blue almost gets ignored by, by the eye. So that's one of the things that I would say is if you're, and why I think that I don't end up having bad starts and stops where I get halfway through a model and I feel like, oh, this is not working. Because when I go to paint the model, 
I will pick the, the primary color that I want to use, whether it's a blue or a teal or a red. Like this is the dominant color I want. And I pick where I want that to be on the model, keeping in mind kind of having balance, you know, and composition on your piece. So if you have a bold color somewhere, that's going to be where the eye gets attracted to if it only appears one place on your model. Whereas if you have it spread throughout your model, it doesn't necessarily focus attention on that. So if it's the only color you have, you want to kind of make sure that it's present in multiple places in your model. But I, I figure out where I want that color, and I know in my mind that everything else I do is going to be neutrals. And so I don't worry later that coming back, but wait, this doesn't match what was there already, because the neutrals just kind of go with anything. They play well with all of the different colors. Now it's possible that I might, you know, if I have a non-metallic metal and I have like a red or something, I might give a little bit of a blue undercoat to some of the shadows in the the non-metallic metal just to have a little bit of extra visual interest there. But it's not something that pops out at you when you look at the model. And I think a lot of beginning painters make the mistake of they look at all the paints they have and they go, oh, I'm going to use red, I'm going to use blue, I'm going to use green. And it just suddenly overwhelms the viewer and the, there's no place that the tension is focused on. There's no like real cohesion in what's going on. Um, so that's that's the big secret is it's how much neutrals you're using that balance the color that makes a successful model. Because, yeah, that's what that's what I call the militant clown is because they're so and I think that's the problem. Like when I do a coastal ranger, the mental desire to use the three or four different um, there's aquatic blue. I've got there. there's aquatic seafoam green over there. They're both beautiful colors. And they are in the same sort of spectrum, but I found that together it did break where to look right. sort of thing because they're both, they're not exactly dominant in the same way, but they are both vibrant. Right. So it's sort of like, and, and on a thing like the cape, the cape's a big cape on this Ranger. So uh, I've always, that's the things as well. Like I always sort of look at it and go like, do I make that cape the, the focus? Mm -hmm. Because it's got nice folds right. and stuff like that. But in a way it's a cape. Right. And is that worth making the focus? Should I make it more something else on the on the? Well, mini? in the most natural place for, you know, as humans, when we talk to somebody, at least in our culture, I mean, this isn't necessary for every culture, but when you talk to somebody, you look at their face. Like that's where your attention's focused to. So when you create a model, I kind of like to try to draw the attention to the chest face area of the model because that just that's just an easy focal point. And so as you go away from that area, that's where you kind of want to not do things that's going to attract attention. So if you were to paint like bright blue boots on some model, like, well, now you're attracting attention away from the more interesting parts of the model. And that's not usually sort of a recipe for, you know, uh, an attractive model for somebody to look at. It becomes too busy and too kind of all over the place. Because usually with oil paintings, um, we were... Uh, last summer we went to Ottawa and we went to the National Gallery there and I noticed nearly every painting not not so much the, the, the sort of like more just sort of symbol sort of ones but anything that was a uh, landscape or a person or uh, a city shot or something like this or a ship whenever approaching it from a distance there was always one thing that you sort of looked Absolutely. at first there was one thing that went like oh and then when we got closer you start to look around the entire thing and notice that he'd painted a bird or a butterfly or a spider web in the in the reeds near the river or or stuff like that. But there was always one thing that took the attention first. Absolutely. And so yeah, I sometimes think that miniatures should be the same. Yeah. Because obviously there was a, there's a reason for that. Uh huh. And a lot of times, if you're painting and you're not quite sure. I mean, if you're not well practiced at sort of glancing at a miniature and just having a gut feeling for where people's attention is going to be, uh, you can take black and white photos of your model and the black and white by pulling all the color out will show you where the dark and light and that can actually start to give you an impression of like, you know, your eye tends to get attracted to the lightest part of a model unless the whole model is light and when there's like one little dark spot, then that might be where it attracts attention. But it used to, tends to be wherever the imbalance is, is where your, your eye is going to get pulled to. And so you could take black and white photos or, you know, go, go on to models that you really, really love. You know, somebody that you respect as an artist, look at their model. First, look at it in color and look for the way they've placed the color on the model. See how they've created composition and balance. And then take the picture and switch it to black and white and look at where they're attracting, like where the light is, where the shadows are, how are they 
you know, pulling your focus onto the part that they want to pull your focus onto. Uh, so yeah, so thinking about like you exam you gave the example of the coastal ranger too about like color balance and and focus, um, and you know things like should you make the cape the focus of the attention and you know that's that's always a tricky question because you know that's a great spot to have a lot of color you've got this big beautiful cloak and then but you know is that going to pull the attention um, and thinking about my advice with the neutral colors. When you think about coastal, you know, we want to think about let's put blues in there and sea foam greens and like, but going back to this rule of use as much neutrals as you can, think about the sand colors, the rock colors you might have on the beach, and think about your miniature being made up mostly of those colors and only accented with whatever main blue or green or something that's going to convey that kind of ocean theme to it. And then if you want to get a little bit of, of other color in there, you can certainly use two sea-oriented colors. Like you could use a teal and you could use a blue. Uh, the more colors you get on the model, my preference is to start making them darker. Mm. Um, I find that if you're going to have, and also thinking about the, the sort of the, uh, instead of complementary colors, because complementary colors make each other more vibrant. So if you, yes. put, you put red and green on the same model, they're complementary, they make each other more intense. And that's not, and that's again going to start creating like a lot of visual clutter on the model when these 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 colors are really intensifying each other, especially if you use them a lot. If you just use a complementary color as a couple accent colors, it can really work well. But if you want to start having large areas that are the complementary colors, you create like a lot of just sort of busyness to the model. So if you're going to have multiple colors, I kind of like and have them on large areas. You know, keep it to the smaller part of your color wheel. So adjacent colors on the color wheel. So like a blue and then leading into greens, so like a blue green. And the, the if you go darker with those colors, they play nicer together. Mm. Whereas if they are both really pastel or they're both a lighter version of themselves, then it starts to, I think, create some more of that visual tension between the colors where it's you just things feel off. Um, so that would be my advice of mixing multiple colors. But if you're going to keep the same color... You can also create a little bit of extra in interest by, if you start with a certain blue green, say, you know, so you can use that, you can highlight it up or you can shade it, you know, maybe add just a little bit, but keep the same base color, but maybe add a little blue to it and then use that color to accent. So it'll be, it'll has the same base in it. It's just a little bit off to create something different, like maybe a different type of, of material that's on the, the model, but it's not going to look like a different color entirely. And so that's that you can create a little bit more harmony that way by also increasing the visual interest a little bit. But I still think that rule of pick one color that you're going to use as your color, like the color color, and then think about everything else as being some type of neutral, whether it be flesh tones, browns, tans, um, grays, blacks, things like that. That's... So I, I, I remember in the movie Kinky Boots, which I saw years ago when it came out, and there's a bit there when... The, the main character looks at this massive thigh high boot and goes with this like detest sort of thing like oh my god I've inspired something in Burgundy <laughs> yeah. and because uh, with the Coastal Ranger I was thinking you have that moment when you can go the boots his boots could be teal because that's a coastal color but then it's probably better just to keep the boots brown or black or like right. black leather boots, because why would he have teal right. boots unless there was some way that would work in and make sense? Because that's, I think, the moments when, like us intermediates, are sort of getting off track with colors because we're thinking like that. We're going, oh, but, you know, he's coastal, so we could do the, the, the blue-green cloak, and his armor can be like sea foam, and then we can do blue boots, right. or because that's the, you know, we've got the water color, and there's a water paint it says sea blue we're going to right. use that and then you get this this weird camp ranger that if he walked into a bar everyone would be going what the hell dude and it's like right. it'd be it'd be like that amateur adventurer who's you know like oh yeah but I, the new store they had these beautiful blue boots and they had this great and you'd be like oh he, this guy's gonna get killed <laughs> yeah, yeah and you know and Obviously, I'm, I'm not trying to give people rules to paint by, and every rule is made to be broken. There are, I'm sure, you could go find a beautifully painted model that has blue boots. But probably that model has very dark blue. It's very, I'm sure it's very dark, probably on the desaturated side to where it's not 
it's not a vibrant blue. It's not attracting your attention. It's more like a dark velvet blue that is that is not the center of focus of the model. And maybe that blue helps to balance some blue on the other parts of the mm. model to create more more balance in, in the miniature as opposed to the only blue on the model is the boots and you're going to look at that model and you're going to see blue boots yeah you know? and, and rather than if it's something that complements the rest of the model in the sense of it creates visual balance it almost then doesn't become a focal point it just harmonizes the rest of the paint job and like like you're saying each miniature is going to be different and it, and it does matter like in the sense that if you did batman the cloak is a massive part of the character and in, in, in a part it is a lot more of the character mm -hmm. and uh maybe dr strange is another he actually has cloak which is going to be fanning out and doing things and it, it is a focal point so maybe on something a character like that it's worth uh doing a lot more right. attention but, th but think about those two characters though batman so oftentimes his cloak is actually the darkest part of his uniform yeah or it's the same color as like his gloves and his boots and so it's not actually the focus point. It's the stuff that's not that color that becomes the focus of the miniature. And so, yeah, it's all about where the eye is attracted to yeah. when you're using these colors and what you're doing to create a nice landing point for people who look at your models and you're not creating distraction. Certainly, I put tons of details on my models that people don't see at first glance and rewards <laughs> closer looking. But those details, at least I hope, don't detract from yeah. the initial... They look at somebody and it's just a pleasing color palette. There's a place for the eye to naturally land and focus. Because um, yeah. do you think about those small things at the start? Like when you're doing, especially freehand work, and I don't mean like on a banner, which is going to be obviously a big sort yeah. of thing, but um, even on dresses and that, you won't just usually paint it one color. You'll you'll put some sort of pattern around the base of the dress or mm -hmm. you know, some, somewhere like, like that. Are you sort of consciously thinking about things that you might be able to put along the, like a dress or if it's a cloak, if you're putting along the, a lot of, I, I saw the freehanders will put uh, some sort of pattern like a, an elvish cloak along the bottom of it sort of thing. They'll do two bands and then there'll be leaves or, or something. Are you sort of thinking about the stuff right from the beginning or is that sort of more something once you're well into it, you start going, what can I add? I mean, a little bit of both. I would say that every time I look at a miniature, and these days almost, a requirement for buying miniatures is that there's places I can put freehand on them. <laughs> That's just my own insanity. You know, when I paint a model, um, you know, sometimes painting these things can feel a little bit like painting by numbers. Um, I mean, yeah, you get to pick the color, but the 3D sculpt is already there. These, you're painting these pants, they're pants. You're painting this cloak, it's a cloak. And so to bring something that's me into the miniature is to choose what I'm going to add that are things that are unique to me that nobody else is going to have on the miniature. And that's like these freehand areas. So I often will identify the places I want freehand and I'll sort of usually decide ahead of time. Do I, you know, if there's a lot of flesh area, do I want to paint a tattoo on this character? Do I feel like it would be something that, you know, would actually enhance this character or would it feel out of place? Um, if it's a really fancy cloak, obviously that's a place that you can add um, like a lot of filigree or something. But then if you're doing a dwarf model, you're probably not going to do scrolling and leaves and that kind of, you're going to have more blocky geometric shapes. So you look for places on the model where putting more blocky geometric is going to enhance the design of what the miniature. So like on that Thrommel dwarf that I painted from Judgment, he's got the gambeson or whatever it is that's underneath his armor. And the two parts that are showing most... They're, they're very sort of rectangular in shape. Like they just, they're mm. these rectangular areas. And so I did kind of a diamond pattern that went at a 45 degree angle to the rectangular shape of where it was showing. But it was a very geometric blocky shape that fit in with dwarven design and just kind of enhanced an area that might otherwise just be a very flat, you know, spot on the model. So it was, it was adding visual interest, but didn't attract attention to the point where it became distracting because it was a dark muted pattern within that area. And do you like adding things like the dwarvish runes to the dwarvish weapons, or do you feel that that detracts the attention from somewhere else to the, the weapon if you can, and the weapon isn't meant to be the focus? I think it really depends on, obviously if something's sculpted on there, you know, it's kind of an opportunity to draw attention to it of, of if it's going to be a very ceremonial weapon that's got a lot of decoration to it. Um, in terms of adding freehand stuff to that, if it's not there, the key with that would be to just decide the level of attention you want people to look at, to pay to that. 
Um, oftentimes, again, if you keep things darker and more muted, it doesn't attract immediate attention, but it can be something that just rewards people looking closer and spending more time on the model. So, you know, if the, if the dwarf has a big hammer, but you want the focus to be on his face because he's got a really angry expression, so you really attract everything to the face, maybe you paint runes that are very subtle. Like they're just a little, mm. they're whatever the base color of the hammer is, but you add a little black to it. And so, you know, you can definitely see it, but when you first glance at the model, it's not the first thing that jumps out at you. It's more just looking like, oh, wait, look, he put runes on the hammer. That's really cool. It's kind of the secondary things that people notice. And like when I first started, the the sort of in style painting at the time was to really water your paint down and then do multiple layers of one. And then you'd take a darker color and add it to the base color and that would become the shadow. And you might add increasing levels of that darkness and you might do five or six shades of shadow mm -hmm. on a 28 mil mini and it was taking 120 hours to do a a one you know a 28 mil mini you know sort of thing is that still a vi like a viable way to paint or have we sort of improved the the technique in the last five or six years I think it is. I think people have, and I certainly, I can speak for myself. When I first started painting, it was very much, you're going to paint 25 layers of paint on this if you're going to get a smooth blend from one color to the next. And yeah. uh, what I found is, and I think part of it is paints have improved in their quality to how far you can thin them compared to the stuff that we started with 20, 30 years ago. Uh, to now, like Scale 75, one of the reasons I love to you paint with them is because they thin very, very nice They so to create these glazes. So I can actually do fewer layers of paint underneath and then come back in with a glaze that can do two things. It can add saturation back to the area because things will start to get a little desaturated, a little uh, pastel as you start to lighten yep. them up. Yep. And so I can go back in and add in these tones, but also putting over a few layers of this glaze starts to help the different layers meld into one another. And I can get just as nice of blends with more saturation in the color now than I used to be able to with less work. I would mm. say. Cause that was the, that's one of the biggest things I've noticed. And I noticed that because as an intermediate, we tend to get a technique and then we want to hold on to mm -hmm. it like completely. It's like, Oh, we've got to thin our paint and we have to thin our paint this much. And we have to do, I mean, we're worse than beginners. Because when, when you're a beginner, you sort of take everything in, but it just sort of scrambles around yeah. and you sort of do whatever. But then you hit that point where you start seeing something sort of works. And so you you jump on board with it like really, really heavily and you just go, okay, it's got to be like this. It's got to be like this. It's got to be like this. There's no other way to do it. There's no other way to do it. And then someone will come out and go, there's uh, non-metallic metals. And it's like, oh, my God, there's non-metallic metals. Okay, that's the only way to do it now. And it seems to be more a intermediate problem. We sort of do. We tend to do that rather than beginners. Beginners don't seem to do that as much. But the intermediates, when there's a new thing or a different idea, we just sort of grab it and that's all we do. Well, and, and I'm not sure it's totally different for for more experienced painters. I, my, I've I've told the story a little bit before, but you know when I first got started painting, um, there was a guy who'd won thirty something golden demons who was part owner in the store that I uh, that I played at, and he. Um, he had a very particular style, and so I tended to kind of copy his style as I was looking at the models and trying to figure out what I wanted to do for painting. So a lot of my early stuff looked like his, and then all my stuff really looked like his until I switched to a new game, and I stopped painting the Warhammer 40k models, which looked like his Warhammer 40k models, and I started painting yep. you know, models for another game. And then I kind of figured out what worked for the army that I wanted to paint for this, which was predominantly using different colors than he used to use. And so I kind of figured out what worked for those colors, and my style started to deviate a little bit. And what I've noticed looking back is I would go through five to six to seven year periods of my painting life where everything was exactly the same style and I would predominantly use the same sets of colors. And it wasn't until I would quit a game, sell off an army, buy a new line of paints, something that would cause me to have this paradigm shift in what I was working on that would all of a sudden create like a six month period where there was an explosion of creativity and advancement in my painting skill, new techniques. 
And then there'd be like five years where that's all I would use is whatever I learned in that six month period of shifting over. Because again, I got into some other game and now I'm painting an army and I'm gonna paint every model in that army to match what's in there. And even stuff I would do on the side, I wouldn't kind of wanna like break up my mental pattern of what I was actually doing. So I wasn't trying new things until, oh look, I just bought a new paint line and let's try this out. And all of a sudden, wait, these paints work a little differently. Oh look, I figured this out, this is really cool. And then I would start doing something. So. I mean, I'm not sure that's just something that intermediate paint, painters face. I, I can certainly look back and go, but I don't know. I also, my own view of myself is that maybe I feel like I'm at the top end of intermediate. I mean, there's people out there who are light years beyond what I could ever achieve. I feel like I'm, I'm an interne- intermediate painter which just has 20, 25 years under his belt that uh, has figured <laughs> out a few tricks. Um, I'm not... <laughs> That's what I like I notice with my own stuff that I will go through periods where I'll, I'll, I'll suddenly look and I go, oh, I've just painted green, like green, 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 green. And then something clicks and goes, that's all I've been painting. So then I go, I've got to swap. But then I'll go back and look and it'll be blue, 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 mm-hmm. blue, blue. And then I'll go, oh, crap. And it'll be red, 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 red. I don't I didn't seem to mix it up as much. So now I, I know I'm trying to be a bit more swapping my projects around, too. I'm not trying to right. do all the ranges at one time because that's sort of I fall into a very... In, in a way, a boring palette, because I realize then all I'm doing, I, if I'm doing them to give away as gifts or whatever, it doesn't matter because they're, they're, they're leaving. But if I look at my shelf, if I've been painting a lot of ranges, I've got a lot of similar colors. And then if I've been painting a lot of knights, they're all similar colors. Right. And do you like for like uh, armor, especially like a knight, which is very silver, just metal, do you uh, like just going sort of the more traditional silvers or do you think that the colored armor is, is a cool sort of thing to do i'm more of a traditionalist when it comes to that i've never i've never loved the the colored armor but of course i'm i'm one of those guys who i just don't paint with metallic paint it's not like uh it's not a thing where i'm taking a stand of saying metallic paint is crap and anyone who uses it is crap it's just i like the consistent finish i get on a model like all the paint has the same finish to it when it's all painted with the same kind of paint. And the metallic Mm. paint creates a different finish on the metallic parts, which is fine. In real life, metallic has a different finish than cloth. cloth. But, you know, when I look at my models, I like to envision them that their animations come to life. You know, animation has a consistent finish on, you know, the entire surface. And that's just visually when I paint my models, that's what I have in mind. And so I don't use metallic paints. And it's, I think it may be easier in a lot of cases for the metallics to bring a, a realistic looking colored enameled um, surface to to bear when you're kind of working off of metallics. That That's just my own personal experience. Um, so I, I tend to prefer the more classic kind of gray silver look, but just like with knights who from the medieval times would have then splashes of color that would accent all of this armor, you know, look for ways that you can make it more interesting by what you, you know, accent it by. Or maybe I probably would use some some colored shadows or something to help bring a little visual tone to the, the mm. to the model, but I would still be, you know, using grays predominantly. But I saw a um, Gundam, and I was completely blown away by this. And it was the guy had painted it like a cartoon, and it looked like a cartoon. I he s- did the shading, individual like the splashes of light that they do in a manga on it it was the most incredible thing i'd ever seen really um i saw you have to to do double takes to to convince yourself it actually is a picture of a model and not somebody literally drew (laughs) yeah yeah that that was the thing i was i was absolutely blown away and they're turning it around and i'm like did they not photoshop something over the top of this the time it would have taken to do and i saw all these comments from traditionalists um saying how horrible it was and I was like, I, I, it was so disappointing to see that sort of response because I'm not sure I would do it myself if I, even if I had that talent. But I, it was such an incredible thing to have done, and just to show that you can do this style of painting as well. Just imagine how boring painting. this hobby would be if there was only one way you were allowed to paint things. <laughs> and well, some days, though, it feels that yeah. way, like. But, you know, the thing about this that I love is just people are painting. And I don't know why we need any kind of negativity that discourages people from painting and producing and sharing their work. The most important yeah. thing is that people are actually in the hobby and and loving what they're doing. And, yeah, there's no place for negativity in all of this. Skin tone is a nightmare for many intermediates, my, myself included. 
I've tried various ways of getting it smoother because it seems to be, it, I think it's the paint. I mean, obviously there's some technique involved, but I think the paints as a color, skin tones seem to be chalky, a lot of them. And a lot of different, I've tried different brands and they, they don't always work out. It always seems to, you get the color come in, but as the color comes in, it just doesn't have that right sheen. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've tried using glaze mediums, which sometimes help. I've used uh, Future, a couple of drops in sometimes, which is a floor wax, but it, it's a self-leveler, which sometimes has helped. But it's getting a, a, a nice, smooth skin tone is, is really difficult for a lot of intermediates. And it's like you said, the face can be such a focal point, uh, especially with the Barbarian. She's showing a lot of skin. So... For her, that is the focal point. She's wearing a, a she's the old school uh, metal bikini. This particular barbarian, and because of that, there's a lot of skin. And not having good skin tone doesn't matter how good my cape is, doesn't matter how good my hair is, doesn't matter how good anything else is. It's horrible if I get a bad skin tone. How do you approach skin tone to try to smooth it out? Yeah, well, and skin is tough. It's tough too because in real life, skin is you know semi-translucent, and you know it's got different layers to it because you're seeing you know you're seeing veins behind it. You're seeing you know areas where there's more blood flow than other areas, and it, it's it's very tricky to replicate. Um, I do have some videos on my YouTube page if people go and and look. I'm currently in the middle of of publishing a series of videos of how to paint a dwarf that I did for Atlantis, and they're Currently, the first three videos are up. I don't know, by the time this releases, the, the fourth one might be out, which is where I come back in and add tone to the skin. But if you look at, I did Alley from start to finish. I did the Celtic busts. And you can see the skin tone I did from that. But the technique that I use is, I start with a basic, well, actually, let me, before I even do this, let's talk about your problem that you talked about, the chalkiness of the, the paint. Mm-hmm. And if you imagine, a lot of people have trouble painting with white paint. A lot and a lot of brands of white paint is not is not actually that good to paint with straight. So a lot of people who are painting with whites actually usually paint with a little bit of an off white, and they're rarely ever painting with pure white paint. Um, there's a visual reason for that, but there's also a lot of the pure white paints are very chalky and they're very yes. hard to get smooth. And part of that is because to get for white to get good coverage, it has to have more density in it, which just creates like more pigment in there, and it's it's a chalkier paint. And, and if you imagine a lot of the skin tones are very, very light, they have a lot mm. of white paint in them as well. So you're going to notice a lot of the same properties of whatever is bad about painting with white paint. You're going to get a little bit of that in a lot of the skin tones <laughs> as well. So that's why yeah. that's why there's, those are going to tend to be a little chalkier than, you know, like a darker blue or a red or something. Uh, now, what I usually do, so I'll start with a kind of a bland mid-tone flesh color and build it up by going lighter and lighter, focusing on the highlight areas. As you do this, you start to really, really desaturate the colors and it does not look like flesh. You know, you don't have the, the sort of reddish tone or, a, or even a greenish tone or brownish tone that a lot of people's faces have. So I build up the highlight layers, but what I'm, what I'm imagining in my mind is I'm just building up kind of the underneath shininess of where the skin's gonna be. Yeah. Then I come back in with glazes and I glaze over the skin with like a pinkish flesh tone or whatever color I want the undertone of the skin to be. And this starts to tint. It just brings that, that little bit of saturation back into the skin without losing the highlights that I painted. And so, mm. and so that's how I bring the color back in. Because then, as you know, again, as you highlight that skin, you're losing the color that skin naturally yeah. is. So I use the glazes to bring the tone back in. Then I come back in with shadows and I start to, sh- to shade. And what's important with the shadows are, or not really important, but what one nice technique is kind of bringing in like a warmer tone for like, if you're thinking about just like a normal Caucasian skin, for example, there's, there's other skin tones that are, you know, different techniques to bring out. But like if you're using a, a Caucasian skin tone, glazing over with like a pink flesh color, I find is really nice. It brings a little bit of the redness to the skin, but then the shadows, you kind of want to go alternate. You want to have a little bit of a cooler shadow color. So then I use something that has a little purple to it. So it's sh- yeah, yeah. It, sh- it shifts a little bit to the blue spectrum to bring some coolness. And it can glazing into the shadows to start bringing in the deeper tones um, there. But that that's ba- my basic technique. It's hard to describe uh, verbally, but I do have those videos that are on my YouTube channel that people can go back and watch and see how I did it on a couple different scale models. I'll post the links in yeah. the description here so they can follow through and have a look. And lastly, hair color, because I find hair color 
it's a little tricky because if you just go brown hair, but if you use the same, sometimes on a 28 mil, it's okay. If you use the boot color and the hair color, you don't notice as much. It's sort of that homogeneity of color sort of just works together. But when you do something, like you said, um, with the Atlantis one, that you always pictured this dwarf had red hair. How red do you go? And if you do go red, does that affect your your choices anywhere else on the figure? A little bit, but the you know red hair, true red hair, tends to not be bright red. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's more of like a burgundy color, yeah. which is shifting into the browns, which is still a more of a neutral color. And I can I can keep it more neutral to where it doesn't contrast. But then what I'll also do is I'll be careful about what I'm picking for the main color of the model. So if I know mm. that's going to be red hair, I know that green would be a good color for the model, or blue would look good with that. Purple, maybe purple and red hair doesn't really go as well together. So, you know, if I want purple to be the main color, that might be more of a blonde would look better with that or yeah. a darker brown. So I do think about that, you know, when I think about the hair color. But I think the most important thing with hair color is a couple things. Um, first of all, to, re to realize that hair is not yellow. It's not red. It's not, you know, it's actually more neutral than that. It's more yeah. towards the neutral spectrum. So when people paint blonde, the biggest mistake they make is they use yellow paint. Blonde hair is not yellow. Or if they paint yeah. red hair, they use like, like fire engine red. Like <laughs> red hair is not fire engine red, unless it's dyed to be that. And you're trying to make yeah. it look like it's kind of like a punk hairdo or something. But what I would suggest people actually do. Oh, and then my other point with that is um, what you use to shade the hair can bring a lot of life to it. So if I'm doing brown hair, I'll actually use some purple shaded down into the shadows, which brings a little bit of okay. color interest and makes it not so just flat, brown, boring yeah. kind of hair. Is that, that it become muddy. Yeah, exactly. And that's not what yeah, the so, color is. So bringing either. a little color into the shadows can help with that. Uh, but what I would suggest people actually do is go look at, go find pictures on the internet, especially probably like models, you know, really high quality pictures where you've got lots of bright lights on them. And so you've got depths of shadows, you've got reflection areas, you've got a lot of nice, the color variation and thing. Print that picture off in color, take it to your painting table and start to put paint right on the picture and find out what the colors are that are in the shadows, what the colors are that are in the midtones, and what the colors, because they're likely to not be what you expected. Um, the, <laughs> yeah. the bear I just painted for Atlantis, that armored bear, which I think real, I, I'm really proud of, it came out well. I printed off a picture of a grizzly bear that Atlantis had sent me and said, this is kind of what I was thinking about for the grizzly bear, just, you know. And so I printed that picture off and I started doing that. And I was like, wow. There's a lot of purple in this undertone. There's a lot of this. And I was figuring out that there were undertones in some of the pictures that when, or the colors that when I just glanced at it, I didn't recognize right off the bat until I tried to color match it. And it just made the fur just look so much better when I painted and not just a boring brown color, but there was depth to the shadows. There was different, you know, things that got brought out in the highlight areas. So, yeah. and I think with human hair, especially, I think that's important. So I really encourage people to do that. Print off pictures and try to color match what's in the picture, the photograph, and that will give you a lot of insights into what the hair, what would help your hair look more natural. That's an interesting idea because I've got a folder on my computer of about, now it's about 1,200 pictures of minis because mm -hmm. anytime I find a mini uh, that I like, thing. some of yours are in there, <laughs> I just save and then I'll just go through and, and sometimes I'll find the exact mini that I'm going to paint and I might have three or four pictures of different different people and I might not always copy it, but I might go, oh, that's a really good idea what they had there that I didn't think of. Uh, sometimes it's just I'll have a bunch of rangers, and then that way if I'm going to paint a ranger, I might have 50 ranger images I can just start looking at and going, oh, that's a good idea, and there's a clever idea. So, yeah, that, actually printing it out and having it there and then seeing what you can match the color, that, that's clever. Yeah, and I, you, I got that idea, and I don't know why I didn't think about this earlier, but I got that idea a couple of years ago when I was watching somebody do um, an acrylic, like, um, canvas painting of Morgan Freeman. They were trying to basically paint Morgan Freeman from a photograph. And I was watching them mixing on their palette and then they were painting on the picture of Morgan Freeman. I was like, that is genius. Like all of these <laughs> things that I have such a hard time figuring out exactly what to do in the shadows and the highlights. Like, why didn't I ever think about that? Yeah. yeah it's it's great. And not cheating at all, by the way. I think that people need to understand. Some, I don't know. Sometimes there's this weird thing that people think like, well, I don't want to go online and find a, a picture of something to paint for freehand. Or I don't want to. It's like, no, anything you do that makes your painting better and helps you improve, 
not cheating at all. <laughs> well, even technique wise, I mean, the, 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 the dirty word is, or two words, is dry brushing. Yeah. There, there's so many times I see, like, oh, you dry brush that. Well, yeah, I did that bit because yeah. it took 10 seconds and it looks the same as if I'd spent an hour on it. If something needs to be spent an hour, spend an hour. If something can be done with dry brushing, I mean, every technique has its place. Right. It's, it's not a tool. A, it's not I, a, I, use, not a I use dry brushing on parts of my models too, even my like really high, high quality models. Just I think what's important that people need to do as they learn these techniques is you file away what are the benefits of this technique, what are the downsides of this technique, and what is it best used for. So one of the downsides of dry brushing is it tends to build up texture on your model. So if you're going for something really smooth and you dry brush it to add your highlights, you're going to add texture that's going to prevent it from looking smooth. But if you're doing something like old cracked leather, it actually could be a benefit to bring texture into the model and the dry brushing actually will enhance what you're trying to achieve. So it's, it's all about just understanding what the techniques can do for you, understanding both the pros and the cons of them, and then making informed decisions about what you're trying to achieve on the model. Because I love dry brushing for uh, bricks, mm -hmm. rocks, stuff like that, which un anything that had an uneven texture. Absolutely. It's, it, it's brilliant for, I find. So if I'm doing quick work, I'll use it on capes if there's a fold. Uh, but as you say, it, it, but you're right. If you have a little bit too much, it's because it, that's when it looks wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not just that the texture's there, but that build up because it, you're just wanting to give a little bit of a slight change in color on the back and you want to do it quickly, but if you have too much paint, instead of it just being that smooth curve of the cape now, there'll be that little build-up, and it might be even, if you've done it wrong, like properly wrong, you'll get a little bit of a point, right. and then you'll have to sand it, and now you're going to be going over your work again, so it hasn't saved anything. But Yeah, so the only, I guess, and I might have, I think I brought it up a couple times, but you know, kind of going back to where we started this whole conversation about the importance of neutrals in your paint scheme and how... Um, if the majority of what you're putting on the model is, is from the neutral color palette, so you're talking about your tans, your grays, your uh, browns, things like that, that it really helps to just make the model kind of almost foolproof in terms of your color scheme. And you just have one, one solid color if it's well distributed throughout your model so the attention isn't just focused to one tiny little area with a bright color. And then everything else is kind of nice and neutral. As you control the brightness and darkness of the model so it attracts the attention to a certain wherever you want to do your focus, it's almost like the model just is naturally going to look good. And I feel like that's kind of where I'm at with my painting is I follow this process and I just have confidence that the final product is going to look good. The one thing that you can sometimes run into when you use so many neutrals is things can look a little boring or bland. And so there's a couple of ways that I try to, um, to keep that from happening. One of them is you can still use color into your neutrals Either you can shift it one way, so maybe you're using a brown, you can add a little purple to your brown so that it's not just like a very bland brown. You know, it's got a little yep. bit of a cool tone to it. So it still reads as brown by the from the eye, but it, it's not flat, it's not boring color. So you can bring color in that way. You can also shade color into the shadows, which is a really, really good way um, to just bring a little. So you have brown leather, shade purple into the recesses or something like that. Just add something that brings just the hint of color. It doesn't even have to be fully perceptible when you first glance at the model. It might mm. be not be until you look really closely, but it just overall, it adds a, uh, a less boring feel to the whole thing. There's just a better balance of things there. Um, the other thing that, that I do is if I have a lot of brown leathers, I will slightly change my color recipe on nearby browns just so it breaks it up a little bit. So if you look at my Atlantis Dwarfs, for example, like the boots are a little bit different color than the the leather patches that are on their knees. Like there's just a couple, I, it's just, I just vary the, the recipe just slightly so it creates a little bit of a blacker brown and a little bit of a, a lighter brown. And they, they complement each other because they're actually based off the same paint color, but there's just a little bit of change there. So if you're gonna use brown on a lot of part of your model, break it up and just vary the brown a little bit. Or if you're gonna use a lot of grays, vary the grays a little bit or add just a, just a hint of color mm. into the gray to make it not so just bland and, and makes sense. Its own, yeah. Very cool. Well, I want to thank gorilla for taking the time to talk to us again. It's always fun. And hopefully you've been able to learn something. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having.